Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you have been sitting in the back row, or if you are new here, and you enjoy what you are hearing, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all so you know every time I upload. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing and would like to buy me a coffee, or you are interested in becoming a member of the channel, all that information can be found down below in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. I'll read the first story an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. So, one night me and my friend were playing some hide and seek in our hometown. We were probably like 13 at the time. So, I went into a small area that is basically like a shortcut from the main road to the side road. I unfortunately went alone and didn't even think of what could happen. Remember, we were only 13 at the time and we didn't bring phones with us, so if something happened to us, nobody would even know. So the game started and I ran sprinting into the woods area. The first 30 seconds was good. Disclaimer, we have a rule that we have to come to the checkpoint where we start and we have to save ourselves from not getting picked to search. After around one minute, I started hearing footsteps. I say, hello, are you one of my friends? And something that was there didn't say anything. So I started back out, fortunately, of the woods area as a main route and two side ones so I could have ran either way. I start blacking out, and from nowhere, the man just appears from the woods and starts sprinting at me while saying, I'm gonna catch ya, in a creepy and eerie way, like a kidnapper. Fortunately, I trained football, soccer for you Americans, so I knew I can definitely outrun him or at least make him tired. I sprint all my way through the woods with only light being from the moon. And after around two minutes, he gave up. I continued sprinting and got myself all the way to the checkpoint and told all of my friends what had just happened. Of course, no one believed me, but I don't care since I know it was real. To this day, I still don't know who or what had tried to catch me that night. But for sure, I know if I wasn't a sports guy, the outcome would be very, very different. So creepy men in the woods... I hope I never meet you again. My father was a handsome, young, 20-something living in a half-sketchy, half-artsy area of Westport, Kansas City, with my mother, and they were newlyweds expecting their first child, my elder brother, within a month. This was the mid-1980s. At the time, my father was into the whole Robert Smith kind of look. Longish dark hair, piercings, etc. And kind of had a sensitive or feminine look going on. He had been mistaken as gay before because of his look. Not to stereotype my own people, but you know what I mean here. This is important in a bit. Anyway. My parents had been shopping around Westport on a street full of little boutique-style shops. My mother stepped into a shop to look around, and my father waited outside, smoking a cigarette. He said a man came out of an adjacent store and struck up a conversation with him. The man was polite and friendly, but as the conversation continued, he became increasingly personal with his line of questions, like, where do you live? Do you want to come over, etc. My father was young and dumb and too trusting, having grown up in a very small Kansas town and being newly transplanted to this large city. But still the man began to strike my dad as odd. 
Just as it was getting weird, my mother came out of the store, came up behind my father, and looped her arm around his. Like I said, my mother was heavily pregnant at this point. As soon as the other man saw my mother do this, he stopped what he was trying to say mid-sentence, turned around, and walked back into the adjacent store without a word. They both thought it was odd, but frankly my dad was glad to be away from that man. They continued on shopping and went home. The man ended up being the Kansas City Butcher, or Robert Burdella, an active serial killer in the Kansas City Westport area. His M.O. was to lure gay men into his home, sexually assault them and torture them, then kill them. He was caught a few weeks after his encounter with my father when a victim escaped his home, fleeing down the street in a dog collar. My father highly suspects that Bob Burdella was scoping him out as a potential victim, and upon seeing my pregnant mother realized he wasn't gay. Oh, and the shop he came out of? That was his shop, Bob's Bazaar Bazaar, a oddity shop that displayed the skull of one of his victims in the window. Caution. This next story involves domestic abuse and really foul language. If you are sensitive to these situations, please skip this story. For those of you that are continuing, listening discretion is highly advised. I was just a sophomore in high school, and I fell head over heels for the new quiet kid and thought he was my forever. Crazy, but I would actually go on marrying down the road just one week after graduation. High school sweethearts. Hmm. Looking back now, I can see how many red flags I noticed, but ignored because I was a young, eagerly wanting to be a grown-up. Fast forward. The night before my wedding day, I was going over last-minute wedding details with my mom, who was easily one of the most caring and selfless people I've ever known. So... Bless my sweet mama's heart when I asked her if she'd be mad if I decided I didn't want to go through with the wedding. Wedding was literally the next day. But, me being me, mom thought I was just messing with her. I couldn't tell her the truth of what was going on now. So, I took a deep breath and forced a believable chuckle. She genuinely thought I was just pulling another one of my jokes. I went on to finally tell her the truth almost a year after I escaped him, and she still feels bad to this day not taking it seriously. No one knew what was going on behind locked doors, but makes sense. I was honestly his biggest PR team. Only two hours passed since saying I do's. He was throwing me out of the truck in my parents' driveway, cussing and yelling that he wanted a divorce recklessly driving off. So much for that honeymoon phase on our actual honeymoon. I ran inside and my dad came out of the bedroom and he can't understand a word I'm saying, but he is trying to basically ask me what was happening. And I say it as clear as I could while uncontrollably sobbing. He hit me. How could he? On our honeymoon? My dad is pissed, but then relaxed and tried to rationalize the situation, like maybe he forgot something, pulling a bad joke or something like that. Then we see his truck flying into the driveway, and my dad smiles and says, See, he's right there. I wipe my tears and walk out of the door and tell them, yes, it was a prank. Inside, I was screaming. I was so embarrassed for myself because now I look like the crazy one. But if I wanted to save this relationship, they could never know the truth. Months go by and he starts being sweeter ever since we had to be long distance because he was in the military at training. But soon I would be packing up my life and moving to Texas with him. I could tell my parents were starting to see the cracks. I had worked so hard to glue together. 
My mom even picked up the phone on the table, mistaking it for hers, and saw this huge message from my ex and just started crying, begging me to stay because he was not a good person. But I assured her that this was way out of character for him. That was a lie. And that he was just lonely. I knew she didn't believe me, but she also knew I was stubborn and I was going to do whatever, regardless of her concerns. After just a few weeks in Texas, I knew my life was in danger. It was Thanksgiving Day, and my family just called to check up on us and just tell us Happy Thanksgiving. And the moment I hung up, the man I thought was my soulmate started cussing at me and saying that I need to stop talking to my family because he was my family now. I let out a little chuckle, thinking he was joking or something. And he picks up our wedding glasses. I specifically had them made for us. And throws them directly at me, shattering all around me. Shocked, I didn't know what to do. So I walk over to the broom and start sweeping up the broken glass. You may hear this and think surely he would be done throwing a tantrum by now, but no. He then throws picture frames at me while I'm sweeping up the glass. Honestly, that broken glass on the wood floor was just a metaphor for any love I had left towards this man. I broke that night. I stopped seeing him as my other half and more as the monster I'm now stuck with. I became very depressed and he loved that. He would break me down over and over again just to get a reaction. Two months go by, and one night, he completely lost his shit over the washer and dryer people, messing up the days they were supposed to come out. And he started pacing back and forth, mumbling words I couldn't quite make out, but demanded that I call and fix it. He grabbed me and set me on the couch, telling me what to say and that I'd better not fuck it up. Like a damn negotiation. This man was paranoid as fuck, making comments that they were doing it because he was a soldier, then started blaming me even though I wasn't even around when he first called in the first place, but still yelled at me for hours until, snap, he walked to the bedroom. Me? I'm on the couch still processing the fucking moment. He then yells at me, You're so fucking stupid. This is your fault. Did you plan this with the workers just to make me look dumb? Or are you really just that fucking dumb? Huh, you fucking bitch? Him again. That's what I fucking thought, you fucking no good ungrateful bitch. Me. You know what? I'm done. You don't do anything anything except complain and bitch at me, blaming me for everything. All you do is cuss and yell at me for no damn reason. He looked at me with this look that I've heard other victims try and describe, and the best I can describe it is a darkness in his eyes, like an emptiness that still causes me nightmares to this day. Without hesitation, he lunges at me in the middle of the day, with the curtains wide open for the whole neighborhood to see. He throws me against the wall and starts choking me. I slowly see black, but he lets go only for a second, because then he slammed my entire body to the floor. At that moment, I either blacked out for my brain being bashed on the floor, or was trying to shield myself from what was happening, but piece by piece, I would come to, and he was holding me by the shoulders and just repeatedly slamming my head on the wooden floor, my screams ignored by the people outside. I pleaded for anyone to call the police and repeated yelling for help over and over and over. My fighter flight takes over and chooses flight. I run to the main bathroom and lock the door, frantically calling my mom because I'm not... In that moment, I just wanted to just hear her voice. And sure if that would be my last. But my poor mom didn't know the nightmare of that phone call until it was too late. 
She was with my sister and dad, and she put me on speakerphone because she usually does this so they can all talk to me like we're all there together. But instead, they hear me screaming for my life and hear my ex calling me awful names and telling me to get my ass in there and to unlock the door. They were confused, and my dad was ready to come down here and kill this asshole himself. But then silent. No more banging, just me softly crying and just trying to calm my mother over the phone that I'm all right, in which I tell her, and that I know I need to leave him, but that I had to do it in the safest way possible, because if he were here, he would catch me. I may not make it out with my life. When I walk out of that room, my ex is just sitting there with a blank stare, like nothing ever happened. This was a theme throughout our three-year relationship, but I could no longer ignore the escalation of his behavior. So, one night, I put my escape plan into action. I was going to make a run for it. It was 2 a.m., keys to my Pontiac were on the kitchen table, and he was asleep in the bedroom that I wasn't allowed in for several days. I busted out of the guest bedroom window. That was my prison, and beelined out the front door quietly, but also as quickly as possible. Nine and a half hours to my home state. Only stopped once in Dallas to fill up on gas. With every mile in my rearview mirror, I felt something inside that reassured me. I'm free now, forever scared, and most have healed or faded. I 100% believe, had I stayed, I'd already be six feet deep. So to my abusive ex-husband that I fled from that late February night, let's not ever meet again, and I do mean ever. Hello everyone. First and foremost, English is not my first language, as I am a Frenchman, but I will do my best. And then to you listening as Phoenix, if I mispronounce something, I'm very sorry. I do not speak French. <laughs> Let's continue on with the story. A few years ago, I was in a relationship with a guy. His name was James, or M20 as a nickname. During three years, in the beginning, he was wonderful. He supported me during my chemotherapy, was kind and funny, a bit crazy, but not in a creepy way. He helped me surviving through my sickness, and I won't be alive without him right now. The last year of our relationship, he changed. He wanted to try new experiences and began taking drugs. I didn't know he was an addict until our breakup. He was totally different, jealous, a liar, Sometimes, which with me, and he cheated on me before our breakup. To be honest, I had pity for him. So after the breakup, I've spent six months helping him. I was a student. He was always at my home, in pain, trying to light his addiction. I said stop when, after a month in an institute, he started drugs again, like three hours after leaving. Sad story, but... It gets worse. During our relationship, I chose my university to be close to him. So I had nobody around. No friends, no family. One month after cutting the rope, something strange happened. Everything began with my cat. One night, I went outside seeing a movie. On my way home, it started raining, and I remembered that I'd left my cat outside. It's a really nice cat, but... Hate water, like every other cat, I guess. I started running to be home early, and when I opened the door, my cat was on the sofa. First thought, what a dumbass, the cat was not outside at all. But then, I hugged him, and my cat was completely wet. It feels weird. I was like, what the fuck? And then, I thought my neighbors could have opened my door for my cat to go inside, 
so I just forgot about it. One week later, I realized that some of my clothes were missing, particularly my undergarments. I've got ADHD, so I blame myself for losing my own clothes. Same with my food and some plates, just like one of my favorite bowls disappeared. It was a student's apartment, so not big enough to lose that many things. But then again, I blame myself. I even called myself a magician, joking about how I can make everything disappear without trying. I lose my mind when I came back from my parents' house and discovered my place totally changed. There was the neighbor's mail on my table with the mysterious headphones. My photos on the wall were all upside down and a black umbrella was on my bed. I didn't own an umbrella. It was scary as fuck. I called my mom and then the police. Yes, always mom first. The police were nice, but told me that there was nothing that they could do except take a complaint. I didn't know who was doing this to me. My ex never had my keys, and even when I said that I don't want to talk to him anymore, I stayed nice. I didn't think anybody wanted to hurt me or scare me. For what? Joking? If that's it, ha ha ha, hilarious. I slept with a knife for two years. Congratulations. My neighbors started getting scared, too. We had a common basement, and someone breaks the door during the night. We found some supplies in it, like a blanket and a plate. Not mine, by the way. I had chains on the inside of my door, so I felt scared when I was inside, but I was scared to leave and coming back to see again my stuff missing. A few weeks go by. In the evening, I had to go to the grocery store. It took me like 30 minutes. When I came back home, there was a note on my bedroom's mirror. Nothing's written, just a smiley face. It creeped me out, and I leave immediately. Again, calling the police. They told me that I could have left the note and forgot about it. I didn't have these kinds of little sticky yellow papers, so it wasn't me, and I don't know who it was. I stay with my mom for a week, spend all economies on a camera, and post for help on social media because I felt totally distraught. After that, nothing. In the meantime, James's sister came to talk to me, saying that one of my favorite jackets was at her parents' house. I remembered wearing this jacket after saying stop to James. Again, I've got ADHD. I might have forgotten, but I didn't see James's parents for like eight months at this time. So, I found that difficult to believe. Also, I suspected my neighbor, who had one of my new keys and was feeding my cat when I wasn't home. But she was in another country during most of the story, so I talked with James last year about that. He swore up and down something that weird and told me he was in another cure center when all the shit went down. Everything stopped after that. I still don't know who did this or why. Maybe my ex, maybe someone else. Now I don't really care, but this is the creepiest story I've ever lived. To my stalker or person being in my home, let's not meet again. I am currently starting to fear for my coworker's life. Let me back up and start from the beginning. My coworker, I will call her Jane, is 33 years old, a virgin, and a very devout Christian. Her family is very strict and extremely religious. I'm not bashing on the religion in any way. I was raised a Christian myself. These people, though, they just seem to take their beliefs to a new extreme. Think of them as the Flanders from the Simpsons. 
I mentioned that Jane is a virgin because she has honestly never even had a boyfriend before. She's been on a few dating websites as of late, but she's usually very strict when it comes to the types of guys she would date. She can be kind of stuck up, which has gained her very little popularity. She recently meets a guy on OkCupid. Okay We're going to call him Miguel. Miguel claims to live in a bigger city than ours, an hour away. We are in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. And that he is 35 years old, also claims to be a virgin, and takes an interest in Jane. They chat for a while and she's very excited. Once they establish a fondness for each other, he claims that he has a $250,000 in savings and a job at Cessna that pays $65 an hour. He had a nice apartment and two cars, one of which was a 69 Dodge Charger. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, we all agree. Everyone but her. They agreed to meet for a first date, and he says he'll drive down here to see her. While driving down there, he claims to get into an accident on the interstate and is left hospitalized. Jane is devastated. The rest of us, she was telling this to, all just assumed that he was lying to her, and this was his way of getting out of the date and her finding out that he was a scum. We didn't think there'd be any more communication afterwards. Boy, we were wrong. They continued talking, and shortly after getting out of the hospital, he claimed he was hit by a car crossing the street. His life apparently took a turn for the worse, and he claimed he was laid off from Cessna. His apartment was burglarized, and all of his money and his other car were seized by the IRS due to a misunderstanding in his taxes from a few years back. Completely believable stories, <laughs> right? Much to our dismay, Jane decides she doesn't care about these things, and she is willing to continue talking to the man. He soon starts calling her daily and coming over once a week to visit her at work. At this point, we got to meet the guy, and he comes off as your typical loser, with a beer belly who lays around on the couch all day, yelling at his woman to bring him a beer. Despite all of that money he claims to have had, he wears clothes that are way too big for him, usually sweatpants and flip-flops. This earned him the name Flip-Flops amongst us at work. He has problems making eye contact with people when he talks to them and has the creepiest smile. We know right away that he doesn't seem very trustworthy. Three weeks into their relationship, he shows up at our work and proposes to Jane. She sadly agrees. As we all shake our heads in disbelief, he tells us he got a new job working for Microsoft down in his city. Yeah, we did our research. There is no Microsoft jobs over there, unless you're working and selling products at Best Buy. And he tells her that he's now seeing a therapist for his anger and jealousy issues. Many red flags are going off in our heads at this point, but Jane doesn't seem to mind any of it. He moves down here to be with her, after claiming that his family disowned him, to wanting to marry a Christian. He claims they're all devout Catholics, and that's the reason why she'll never get to meet him. As if this isn't ridiculous and over-the-top enough, things start to get creepier from here. He tells us that he has a new job for $25 an hour as the head engineer at Exide Manufacturing. The head of HR at Exide is actually a relative of of a friend of ours. So we ask her about this. They never heard of this man and the position he claims he has doesn't even exist. We try to call Jane about it, but she brushes it off. All of our comments and claims that we are thinking too much about it or we're just jealous 
He starts picking her up and dropping her off from work every single day, as well as picking her up for all of her lunches. She still believes he has a full-time job and that he's only doing this because of how much he loves her. We start to feel that he's just wanting to know where she's at at all times. He asked the maintenance man at our work, after their first meeting, to be the best man at his wedding. This doesn't strike Jane as odd, because apparently Miguel is just untrusting of most people and has no friends of his own. They all want him for his money. Her parents loan him their spare van, so he can use that to drive from now on. To our shock, her parents are already buying baby clothes and supplies for the couple. They are completely won over by the man. I think they're just blindsided by the fact that their daughter finally has someone and will give them... Finally has a daughter who will give them grandkids, which is a really sad thought. By this point, we noticed her personality growing slightly more stressed and depressed as time goes on. Now, if you've listened up to this point, you're probably thinking, oh, she's just another dumb girl who picked up a sleazeball guy who's milking her for all she's worth. And you're definitely not wrong. We all thought the same thing until she one day dropped this little bomb on us. He has just recently told her that he used to be specs op in the military, the Air Force to be exact, and they've decided that they want him to work for them again. They'll pay him $75,000 for working, three days, three weeks, three months. The story always changes, something she doesn't find suspicious at all. Testing military equipment that's too dangerous and could be life-threatening. He agrees to the work, and we all think he's cooping out of the relationship. She then tells us that if she wishes to remain in contact with him, they'll have to get married as soon as possible, and she'll have to be prepared to move away with him. She explains that the military has been calling her, and making stops at their house to explain to her that she'll have to marry him immediately. And she needs to be prepared to move to an undisclosed location at any given point. From that location, she'll not be allowed to make any contact with friends and family, since all that is going on is top secret, and she has to prove that she can be trusted. Obviously, all of us are now alarmed. Everyone but her and her family. They are delighted that she was with a military man and are proud that she gets to be a part of something much bigger. The rest of us, sane people, are trying to figure out what on earth he can be plotting. Is she going to be hijacked into human trafficking? Is he going to murder her? One of our co-workers has just called the human trafficking hotline, and they think that this definitely sounds like something they have seen before. Unfortunately, they can't do anything about it until it actually makes a move and he takes her. We're looking into contacting our local police to see if there's anything they can do about this before she gets the phone call that tells her when they have to make their move. This is all so crazy. We don't know what to expect or just what danger she's really in. Any thoughts would be appreciated. Thank you for listening. Oh yeah, here's an update. The first time I met Miguel, it was on a freight day at work. We all work at a retail store. Jane and the rest of her department had just finished their freight and they were allowed to go home for the day. I grumbled as I worked in the department next to them and had to finish my freight by myself. I work right next to the time clock, so I saw Jane clock out. About 10 minutes later, a guy shows up in sweatpants and flip-flops. He smiles creepily at me 
as he wanders around her department. I continue putting up my freight. He walks up to me and hands me a Pepsi. Can you give this to Jane, please? Oh, sorry, dude. She just clocked out for the day. What? His face dropped as he darted to the front door. I shrugged it off and continued working. A few minutes later, he comes back slightly frustrated. Her car is still out there. She's still here. I gave him a funny look and stated that I saw her clock out. He stormed off again. A few more moments later, he returns furious. Her car is out there. Where is she? I am a bit alarmed. Jane is pretty obese. So I thought to myself, so I thought to myself it was probably taking her that long to get across the store. Do I need to get a manager on you? Where is Jane? Fortunately for me, my boyfriend showed up at that time. He expected me to get off at the same time as the rest of my co-workers, so he came in trying to find me. Did you say Jane? I just saw her in the parking lot. Flip-flop storms out as my boyfriend and I gave each other what-the-fuck looks. The next morning, Miguel showed up at work and proposed to Jane in our stockroom as we were unpacking boxes. My boyfriend laughed when I told him this. He wasn't surprised that Jane was dating that Neanderthal. Looking back on it now, I think that the fact that Jane could slip through this guy's grasp and actually do something unnoticed by him freaking out. He didn't have as much control as he wanted. That might have instigated his proposal, making him want to make sure he had complete control over her, which is a terrifying thought, by the way. All right, guys, boy, was this unexpected for me. I initially tried posting this over a month ago. It however, kept getting caught in the algorithm of a bot in this forum and was flagged it immediately taken down. No matter how many times I edited it, apparently it was a wall of text. I finally got it approved a few days ago, and that's why I'm sharing it with you now. As you can imagine, a lot has happened over the past month, and that's why I'm here now to let you all know just what has been going on since. To those who want the short answer, she is fine now and the situation is nearly completely resolved. Long answer, keep on listening. To answer a few questions, I'll start with. To those of you who guessed Wichita, Kansas, you were mostly correct. Wichita is the city where he's from. Geez, you guys are good. Why not hire a PI? Well, quite frankly, I don't have that kind of money for that. Why don't you and your coworkers all pitch in to get one? Honestly, the majority of my coworkers really don't like Jane, and that's putting it nicely. I know this will sound cruel, but most of them were just counting down the days that they didn't have to see her anymore. She's always had this bad habit of rubbing people the wrong way. Is she a naive girl? Yes. Is she stupid? <laughs> also yes. Ever since I've met her, she's always insisted on being the first to give relationship advice. To me and many others, by the way. Despite having no experience of her own. She's actually the first to throw in her opinion and give advice on most subjects, usually on stuff that only she thinks she knows everything about. She comes off as a Miss Know-It-All and is very important. Having done missionary trips in Africa before, she assumes she's seen the worst of humanity and she's more than knowledgeable of the evil in the world. She also likes to butt into people's business, whether she's welcome or not. A few co-workers have tried setting her up on dates before, 
And when she comes back home from them, she is usually furious and gives a lecture on, how dare you think he was good enough for me? I would also like to state that this is not the direct result of her faith or religion. So you guys can stop throwing that as an excuse. It does play a part of it, but most of it is the fault of her own personality, I would say. I'm a Christian also. I was raised very sheltered. I was homeschooled all throughout high school, and everyone I knew was from our church. I didn't have my first date until I was 20, and he became my first boyfriend. He's an agnostic metalhead, and my parents insisted he go to church with us before he could be approved. He showed up in trip pants, spikes and studs, and a shirt that boldly read, fuck. He was nothing but kind to the congregation, and they had to have a type of intervention with me the next day to make us break up. We are still together to this day, and our seven-year anniversary is this Halloween. I'm very capable of making my own decisions, and my number one rule is to not be an asshole. If my religion calls me to be an asshole, I tell it to fuck off. I never try to force it on anyone. My beliefs are for me and me alone. I understand common sense and reasoning, and though I've been through hardships, my life is pretty decent. So no, I will not take Jane's religion or sheltered life as an excuse for her ignorance and lack of common sense. Sorry for talking about me so much. I was just trying to prove a point. Now, with these bits of info, I will continue on to the story. At around the same time this story was originally posted... I think the same weekend. It turns out that Jane and Miguel had a secret wedding ceremony at our church and were now married. Yes, there was a certificate in everything. Full-blown, legally binding marriage. None of his friends or family were present. There's a shocker. Only Jane's family and their pastor. She hid it from the rest of us for about a week. During these days of us being in the dark, we noticed a lot of mood shifts with her. One day, she would come in beaming and happy. The world was perfect for her. The next day, we would see Jane's and Miguel's Facebook accounts had been deleted. He had a recently made-up account. No pictures of him. Just pictures of his nice cars. He rarely used it, and all of my family on the account looked nothing like him. Some of you noticed in the comments that I'd mentioned him being blondish-haired, blue-eyed, and light, though dirty-looking skin. He claimed he's Spanish, but all of his family was very distinctly Hispanic-looking. We were afraid that he wasn't wanting her, usually overly talkative self, to give too much info about their situation, movements, and whereabouts when he kidnapped her. She confided in a co-worker that he had a lot of outbursts, and though he hadn't been violent, he had suddenly become a different person. We tried warning her that he was dangerous, but she assured us that he was just insecure from having been cheated on so many times in the past, and that it was nothing. It was sad to say she was definitely in an abusive relationship. The saddest part is seeing a situation like this and knowing that they can only help themselves at this point when they refuse to listen to everyone else. Jane also had a pet cat that she'd had for about eight years at this point. Miguel was always getting angry at that cat, accusing Jane of loving it more than him, etc., her cat likes to paw at its food bowl, and when you pour food into it, and one day as he was trying to feed it, she playfully pawed him. He went into a rage, stating that the cat was trying to attack him, and as punishment, my cat would go without food. For days, when Jane would come home from work, she would notice her cat getting more depressed and would cry a lot more. 
He would assure Jane that the cat is fine. I fed it twice today. Don't feed it or it'll get fat. He was trying to starve and was probably abusing the poor cat. And she didn't see this as a sign to leave the asshole? Yeah. Hmm. Shortly after these incidents, Jane wound up incredibly sick and had to get rushed to the ER. She had a high fever, but that is the extent that she told us at work. She didn't return for three days. We were terrified that he had tried to poison her or something to get rid of her. She didn't find it strange at all that he wasn't at work for the days she was sick at home. It was this time that word made it into our work that they had been married. She came back to work, seemed to be fine. Around this time, Miguel got a phone call from the military stating that he had to report to Fort Scout for top secret weapons testing. And shortly after this, they would have to prepare for their big move. I dare you to look up Fort Scott, Kansas, and see if that seems like the kind of place that would be super dangerous top secret military weapons testing. I can't tell you how many lies he's told that could easily be disproven by a simple Google search. She never questioned him about any of this. Unfortunately for him, the family van of hers that he'd been driving had broken down on his way to the test site, and her father had to come bring him home. By pure luck, the military called afterwards and told him that the equipment testing had exploded and killed a few men. So he was so lucky to have not turned up that day. They changed his plans, and his next top secret mission would be in next April. And it would be then that he and Jane would be moving. With this said, I would like to point out that I do get along with Jane. I do understand some of where she's coming from. And I don't blame the rest of my coworkers one bit for not liking her. A few of us still agree, though, that as annoying as she can be, and despite how stupid she's being, she still doesn't deserve to be murdered or trafficked or whatever would happen to her. So for those of us that cared, we were glad that we at least had until April to figure out what we could do. To continue from here, I would explain that before they were married, Jane was surprisingly good at keeping to her details. Miguel had to live with another man from Jane's church and not with her. So as to keep their marriage bed sacred and to not be tempted. Miguel made it abundantly clear to June that he hated these arrangements and would start fights wherever it was made clear he wasn't going to get laid any time soon. A week or so after the van broke down, a letter arrived at the house of the man Miguel had been staying with. It was inquiring about why he had missed the court date for giving away his parental rights back to his wife. Fortunately, this man from the church actually had common sense, so he made up with one of Jane's sisters to discuss what to do. Despite all of her family fully loving and supporting the couple, one of her sisters was actually hesitant and showed some doubt. There's a sign for intelligence life after all. Jane's sister used this information to find Miguel's wife on Facebook and talk to her, while the church man ran a $30 background check on Miguel. A free background check had been run on him before, but nothing suspicious turned up. Surprisingly, this one also turned up nothing. He had to shell out over $200 for a real background check. That safely showed how much of what Miguel had said about himself and was complete bullshit. Miguel had been married twice up to this point. He had four children with his first wife, and they both had given up custody of the kids, who were now living with Miguel's grandparents. The real reason that Jane was never going to meet his family. He had one kid with his most recent wife, and they had just gotten divorced. 
Their divorce was finalized a few days before Miguel and Jane's wedding. Sadly, this is all of the information that me and my co-workers were able to find out that turned up in the background check. Not one of us has told us anything else. To hear the rest of the story, stay tuned for part two. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. Before I go any farther, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chris Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klemko, Anita B., Nat Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Call Me Later, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support, for without you, there would not be a me or Back to Ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until the next time, please take care of yourself and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.